I want to talk to you about something called a pointer. And I've been trying to put this off as long as I could, but the day has come. So we have to talk about pointers. I feel like you guys are old enough now. I think you can, you can handle this. You know? We're ready. So why are we going to learn about pointers? Well, it has to do with what I'll call linked data structures. So we just learned how to build our own collection, how to build an array list. We did it using an array. An array is a big brick of memory where all the little ints are next to each other in a big chunk. That's one way of building things, and it works pretty well in a lot of cases, but sometimes that's not the strategy that you want. Another way of building things is to put each little element of data in its own little container and then sort of glue the containers together, link them together. If you ever had a toy called Barrel of Monkeys when you were a kid, it's kind of like that, the little monkeys holding arms into a chain. It's also like tr cars on a train, you know, you link the little cars together. Why do they build a train with lots of little cars linked together instead of one really, really long car? Why do they do that? Turn. Okay, it can't turn. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> the car can't turn if it's not in smaller pieces. That's a really good reason. Turning is a good thing. What are the, some other reasons? You can take the train apart, like, oh, I don't like car number seven anymore. Uh, it's damaged, or I need to swap it out. I'll pull that car out, and I'll put a different car in. It makes the thing more modular, more flexible. So, I mean, that's kind of what we're going to talk about, is how to build a collection more like that. And an array is like one giant car. Uh, not always what you want. OK, so the collection that we're going to learn how to implement is called a linked list. We talked about this briefly back when we were doing homework two. I com you know, compared vector to a linked list collection that was part of our Stanford library. And you might remember at that time, I said that each of those two was better or worse at certain things in terms of where you insert more quickly, uh, what operations are fast versus slow. They had trade-offs. So we're going to learn how that linked list is built. In order to do that, I have to teach you this thing called pointers. <clears throat> pointers have to do with memory. A pointer is basically a memory address of a variable. So whenever you create a variable, it's put in the memory somewhere. I think you guys probably have a picture of this, sort of. Maybe, maybe not this picture, but you have some notion like the variables and the data in my program, while it's running, those are stored in the memory, right? So if you declare variables, some memory is set aside to store them. And all memory is referred to by what we call memory addresses, which are just numbers. It's like if you go to the, the piece of memory at this address, you will find the value of x. Addresses are often written in hexadecimal, base 16 uh, format. So like that memory address of x, I just made it up. These are not like special numbers. I just like totally made up these numbers. Uh, 7f8e20 is some integer. You could translate that to base 10 if you wanted. If you went to that number byte in the computer's memory, you would find the contents of the variable x. Okay? And typically, not necessarily, but typically if you declare several variables in a row, they'll be put next to each other in the memory. So regardless of exactly what these big numbers are for the memory addresses, you'll notice that the address of x is four less than the address of y. And when I declare an array, maybe I get the three elements of that array kind of next to each other in the memory. Okay. <clears throat> there is an operator that you can use in C++ called the address of operator, which is an ampersand. If you write that operator in front of the name of a variable, it will return to you, it will yield to you the memory address of that variable. Now, of course, you wouldn't really need this <laughs> for anything that we've been doing, but you can do that. So in my fake example here, if I printed x, c out x, it would print 42. If I said c out the address of x, it would print whatever, 0, 7, F, 8, wherever in memory x was stored. If I ran the program again, it would probably print a different number because it just sort of picks some place to put the program in the memory. It might pick a different place when you run it again the next time. So there's nothing special about those numbers. I print y, I print the address of y, etc. Okay? Memory addresses, ampersand operator. A pointer is a variable that stores a memory address. Why would you want to do that? Well, I'll show you. But the syntax for a pointer is you write what sort of thing it's going to point at, and then a star. So I made a variable called p, which stores an int pointer. In other words, it stores the memory address that an int is found at. 
and what you can set p equal to b is the address of some int. Okay? So ampersand x is a value of type int pointer, <laughs> and I can store that value in a variable of type int pointer. What can you do with a pointer? Well, you could print it out, and then it'll print what the memory address is. It'll print 7f8. That's not that useful. But you can use what's called the dereference operator, the star operator, which means go to the memory that p is referring to. If I say star p, it basically means go to that place in the memory and print the value that would be found there. Star p prints 42. So it's a little confusing because you say star and then p here, and then you say star p here. This star is like I'm saying this is a pointer. And here I'm saying go to the thing that's pointed at by p, which is the value 42. And that is the value of x in my example here. So sort of star p and x are kind of equivalent. You could think of them as being equivalent, OK? But where it gets really interesting is you can modify star p. Star p equals 99. That means go to where p is pointing at, and when you get there, put the value 99 there. OK? And once I've done that, if I print x, it'll print 99. Even though I didn't say x equals 99, I said star p equals 99. They're the same, because p is pointing at x. That's how we would kind of talk about it. OK? Yeah? Does star p? No, star p changes too. If I did c out star p endl, it would print 99 also. Those are kind of equivalent to each other. If you change one, you would change the other. Like, or vice versa, if I said x equals 99, print star p, it would print 99. They're both, basically both of those commands are going to go to the same place in the memory and change the value that's there. Okay? So far so good? Any other, do you have a question back there? Or no? no? When I was in uh, college, I had this like swooshy hair, like I actually had hair back then. And I was super vain about it. And so I was always like doing this, like fixing my hair and stuff in class. And I got called on all the time. And I was never raising my hand. <laughs> I was always fixing my hair. And then I felt bad because I didn't want to admit that I was so vain and I was fixing my hair. So then I made up a question. <laughs> and usually I wasn't paying very good attention, so my questions were really bad. Um, OK, well, it, you can have a pointer that points at nothing or points at bad stuff. So <clears throat> if you declare a pointer and you don't set it to point at anything, you could print it. And you know, in C++, if you, don't, if you don't initialize a variable, it's just given some garbage random value. So p is pointing somewhere. We don't know where in the memory. And if I say print it, it'll tell me where that is. But I don't know anything about memory addresses. So I don't really know what to make of that address. But if I say go print what p is pointing at, it could be pointing at anything. It could be pointing you know, into any program, into any piece of memory anywhere. And if I try to go there, that could actually crash my program or just print garbage or who knows what it'll do. It's unpredictable, undefined behavior. So it's kind of a garbage, uninitialized pointer there. I guess in my slide, it's pointing at a gremlin. I think I was trying to make a joke here. I think this is like dead, D-E-A-D. -E I don't know. It's never mind. Um, there's something called a null pointer. I bet you've maybe heard of that term before. You maybe heard you've used null a little bit in 106a equivalent class. So null is the memory address zero, and what's stored there is nothing. You're not allowed to put anything there. That's a special memory address where nothing is is to be stored. If you say int pointer p stores null, you're saying p points nowhere. P points to technically p stores zero. Um, and if you try to print p, fine, it'll print 0. That, that's fine. If you try to follow p, go where p is pointing and show me what is found there, it'll f go to pointer address 0, and blackness will consume your program, and your program will crash. I said on the last slide, if you had a garbage pointer, it was unpredictable what it would do. It was garbage. It was unpredictable behavior. If you have a null pointer, that is predictable. That will crash your program if you try to follow a null pointer. OK? But you know, null isn't like a bad thing. You might say, why would I set my pointer to point to something that will crash my program? Well, maybe I just don't know what to make it point at yet. Maybe later I'll make it point to something more meaningful. So null's not a bad thing. You can check whether a pointer is null. There's a shorter way of asking whether a pointer is null. You can just say, if p, that means does p point to something that isn't null? If not p, you're asking, is p pointing to nothing? Is p null? So if p's not null, if p's null, that's what those mean. OK. Any other questions so far? Like, are we so far so good? 
you can make a pointer that points at an object. We were learning about a date class, we're writing a boggle class. You can make a pointer that points at an object. Why would you do that? Well, you know, sometimes you want to refer to different objects by different names in your code. So I made a date variable called D. It initialized itself. That's a pretty vague picture. Like somewhere in the memory there's an object for D. It's got a month variable inside, it's got a day variable inside. Objects have methods inside of them. So it's some kind of blob of memory with all those things in it. I don't care exactly how those things are stored per se, but they're in the memory somewhere and there's an address to go get to them. I can make a date star P that is storing the address of D. So now P kind of points to there. On my picture there, it points to D. I can use P to invoke the behavior of D. The way you do that is this thing called the arrow operator. You say P arrow days in the month. And now it's the same as saying D dot days in the month. Why is it a different operator? Well, because D is an object and P is a pointer to the object. Basically what I'm saying here is I'm saying start at P, go to what it's pointing at, and once you get there, there will be a method called days in month and run that method. So follow this pointer, go to that object. When you get there, run his days in the month method. Okay. And so for example, just like we were saying before where you follow the pointer and you can modify the thing it's pointing at, if, uh, <clears throat> if I called the next day method, the one that moves the day forward by one, if I called that on P and then I printed out the state of D, I would see the difference. They're the same object, they're sharing the same place in memory. Now one reason you might want to have a pointer to an object is that pointers to things, um, <clears throat> well, it has to do with the, the length of time that an object stays alive. So we talked about this a minute ago, you know, when we had a destructure for an array list. If you create an object and then you get to the end of the function that you created it in, the object is thrown away, cleaned up. In main here, I have date D1. At the end of main, D1 gets cleaned up. That's not different than any other data type. If you get to the end of main or foo or whatever it's called, then uh, int x gets cleaned up too. Both these get cleaned up. If you have main here and you declare a, you declare d2, at the end of this function, those get cleaned up as well. Well, then you say, what if I want to make a date object that doesn't get cleaned up at the end of the function? Well, you might think maybe I'll make it out into a global variable or something, but there's another way of doing that. If you want to make an object in here but not have it die when I get to the end of here, and that's using this word new again. We saw new when we created an array. That was the only time that we've used that word so far in this class, but here is another place. If you say new followed by a class of yours, like date or boggle or something, what that does is it creates an object, constructs it, and it returns a pointer to the thing that it created. And when you get to the end of the current function, it doesn't delete the object unless you say to delete it. It keeps it alive. So <clears throat> I want to draw a contrast between this syntax on this slide and this syntax on the previous slide. This syntax is how we've used, usually been creating objects. That's what we've done all quarter. And their behavior is what you've expected. When I get here, it goes away, all that kind of stuff, right? This new syntax. When you say new, you get the pointer, and it doesn't go away at the end. I can even prove it to you. Well, I don't know if you believe me or not, but um, if I go to the main that's using the array list, so I have a destructor, right? And so it says um, see out destructor called. Okay, and then here. When you make one, I'll say constructor called. Okay, and then in the client, in the main, I don't think I want to call this. I don't want to see a millions of lines of output. Uh, I'll just do array list and I'll do test add there. So when I compile this and run it, it says constructor called, constructor called, destructor called, destructor called. Okay, what if I also made one right here called array list star p list equals a new array list? What's that look more like? That looks like how you create objects in Java, doesn't it? Hmm. We'll come back to that. But okay, so if I do that, 
That's also creating a list. This is creating a list, and this is creating a list. The difference is, when I compile and run this, <laughs> it says I'm not using my new variable. That's right. Okay. But now look, I get three constructors called, and I get two destructors called. So C++ cleaned up this one for me when I got down here, and it didn't clean up this one for me. And that's actually related. You had a question earlier about you know, this business when I say new, and here I have to say delete. Like It's kind of the same thing. If I really wanted that destructor to get called a third time, if I wanted this thing to get cleaned up, I would have to say delete plist and watch what would happen. It destructor gets called three times. So anyway, I'm just saying when you create objects using this word new, two differences occur as opposed to just creating them this way. Number one, it creates them as a pointer. Number two, it doesn't free them up. You have to free them up yourself. Okay? Those are two things that happen differently.